folks, this is Dr. Emily Sherning with AR, and I've got your 2050 climate forecast for coastal New York, including New York City and Long Island. In my last video, I shared data to help us visualize the complex patterns that are projected to result in a real abundance of interesting microclimates for inland New York. For this coastal part of the state, it's a totally different story. The seasonality, the summer and winter, I can give you a pretty straightforward look at these projected climate patterns. But the most important thing to take away from this video relates to sea level rise. First, let's do an overview about the projected climate. Your frost free season is projected to increase by four weeks. The spring will come about two weeks earlier, the fall will come about two weeks later. That's a big shift in seasonality. And let's look at the winter now, just a second, and we're going to go over to the USDA plant hardiness zones map. So we've used this map before, and the plant hardiness zones gives us information about historically the average coldest winter temperature. So right now you can see that uh, coastal New York, the city, Long Island, it's squarely in zone seven, not a complicated story. Let's go over here and uh, visualize it for 2050 at the lower emissions scenario, which I think is the most likely based on both current legislation and the fact that this, uh, the next 10 years are gonna freak people out. They're gonna make people wanna behave. If you look here, you can see there's a pretty clear zone transition for the entire area moving from zone seven to uh, zone eight. Some patches of Long Island will stay a little bit cooler. If we don't reduce emissions, if we continue on our current path, I do wanna show you that Manhattan would sit squarely, and let's zoom in so you can see Manhattan a little bit better, in zone nine, which is the current um, hardiness zone of Charleston today. That's not really a future that's desirable, that uh, is gonna completely change the lifestyle there, and it's not a future that we have to have. The reduced emissions scenario that the government has modeled here uh, with RCP 4.5 is not like an out there radical um, reduction of emissions. So we know the winters are going to be significantly milder, a full uh, plant hardiness zone milder. Let's check out how the summer heat will change under that likely lower emissions scenario. So if we look here, this is the USDA heat map. And this allows us to look at the historical heat zones, looking at data from uh, 1980 to 2009. And this key shows us how many days a year tend to be over 86 degrees. So right now we can see here in the heart of the city, we're looking at um, maybe a month and a half where it's over 86 degrees and cooler on Long Island. Uh, less than a month, substantially less than a month out towards uh, Hampton Bays here. And let's look at how that's going to change under that projected lower emission scenario for 2050. You can see that's a very substantial heat up that we're looking at. In the city here, we're going from about 45 days max over 86 to um, more like 90. We're looking at rough doublings of heat in this coastal New York area. And that's a substantially increased power burden. If you want to think about the expenses of climate change, those days over 86 are days that many people would feel much more comfortable with air conditioning. So if we don't reduce emissions, the hot season length would be projected to increase further. But this sort of uh, temperature stuff is not the only reason to work to meet our country's emission goals for the 4.5 scenario. If you're in coastal New York, here in New York City, if you're on Long Island, it's absolutely critical to fight for reduced emissions because reduced emissions help to keep our projected sea level rise down. We're gonna check that out in just a second. You know, people talk about future carbon capture technology and that's great, that would be wonderful. That would help to reduce this sort of heat event on the land, but once the ice melts, once the sea level rise happens, even with carbon capture technology, we can't lock that water back up into ice on a timescale that's going to be useful for us. 
So in a second, we're going to go to NOAA's sea level rise viewer, and we're going to look at one and two feet of sea level rise, which are not unreasonable by 2050. Right now, though, if you look for sea level rise in New York, you see a bunch of stupid images, which I want to show you right now. All right. Thanks for your patience. Look at New York sea level rise. Look at all this stuff where they're like, oh no, eight levels, eight feet of sea level rise are going to inundate the modern city. It's hopeless. The modern skyline will be intact. It will just all be underwater. You know, I think people make these to try to be educational, but also to scare you. And they think that you're dumb, that you can be scared like this. This is not, this is not what the city would look like with eight feet of sea level rise, right? I think it would look a little less intact. And I think that we would have done some work leading up to that. I want you to know this is not the threat to look for. These rapid changes, these huge changes are not the kind of awareness that is gonna help drive us to action or that are gonna give us the warnings we need to be alert to act. When you consider New York and climate change, don't take pictures like that seriously. Why would you see eight meters of sea level rise on top of the modern day skyline? You know, the sense that the changes will be immediate is deceiving. What we should be aware of, what we should be concerned about is the slow creep, making sure we notice the slow upward creep of the water. And as we do that, we need to consider the fact that this city, there's a lot going on beneath the surface that's gonna be impacted by sea level rise well before you see the water creep over onto the sidewalks. The more the sea level rises, the more dramatic and damaging storm surge and other weather events will become, and that damage is going to start below the ground. So let's get into the NOAA tool. Let's actually look at this thing. Give me a second. All right, here we go. So this tool shows us the coast with the mean higher high water mark today. Let's get down in here so we can see real good. And we're going to look at one and two feet. So I don't want you all to feel neglected up here in this part of coastal New York. Let's do a little look around the coastline here. I've done a detailed dive. I can tell you that with one feet and with two feet, this part of coastal New York sees almost no direct inundation of housing stock. You see these marshy areas up here. And if you look in there, they're mostly areas that have been reserved, maybe turned into a golf course, maybe uh, looking at uh, potential pond areas. They're not places where there's houses, they're known marshes. So a lot of the wiggle room that has been wisely built into this coastal area of New York is gonna, kind of like the elasticity in the system is gonna be taken up by two feet of sea level rise, where coastal storm surge is gonna be more of a problem because you don't have these buffers you've wisely put in. But if we look over here, as we go into the city itself, and then especially as we go into Long Island, you'll see that it's a different story here. And that uh, upper part of coastal New York, it actually is a very good outlook. So let's look here over Manhattan. Right now, we can see that there are some areas that are prone to flooding well inland here. And let's bump up the sea level rise to one feet and two feet. And um, you'll see that some of these areas that are showing up as being prone to flooding, they're occurring very well inland. And that can help us to understand this big problem that may not be apparent to people who aren't familiar with New York City related to that crucial underground infrastructure. The more the sea level rises, the more we have a problem where underground infrastructure is below sea level. And you know, water, it's very powerful. It finds its level, it gets where it wants to go. Already in New York City, we're seeing the subways flood very dramatically during major weather events. It's a scary situation. Imagine that being trapped underground with the water rising. But let's look over here. Let's look at Long Island. Go back to the current mean and we'll zoom out a little bit to give you a bigger picture because you'll see that Long Island is really gonna be taking the brunt. Look there, with one foot, substantial coastline changes with two feet, even more dramatic. And if we zoom in, and I've, I've looked all up and down the coast, I can tell you this is true throughout the coast. We see substantial direct inundation projected for large areas of uh, housing stock. 
And that's very sad. It's very serious. We're looking at direct inundation of uh, people's homes, people's dreams, right? People worked hard for these things. This is uh, a very scary reality that we're looking at here. It's, uh, and we gotta remember that Long Island map is just the mean higher high water mark projected for 2050. So there's a serious storm. You're gonna expect water damage to homes much farther up on that Southern coast. So between sea level rise and extreme weather events, urbanized coastal New York is dealing with very serious infrastructure challenges. And when we have to look at this level of challenge straight in the eye, it's very scary. There's a natural impulse to look away, but we can't look away. This future is locked and loaded. This is the best reasonable scenario I'm presenting you. And I assure you, I would love it if I were wrong and none of this came to pass. But when we deal with a scary reality like this, one way we can find our way through is to look deep into ourselves, into our values, our origins, and our strengths. And I think we don't have to look far into New York City's origins to find some hope here. You know, this was a Dutch colony. The Dutch built here because it felt familiar, right? It felt enough like home that it could become home. And the Dutch, the, the Netherlands, they're universally acknowledged as the masters of water. There's a lot of people living in areas that would be underneath the mean higher high water mark in the Netherlands, right? In order to save this region in its current form, and, and let's get real here. This is a world city. This is a massive urban area. It's not something you can move or subdivide, or everyone in New York City is gonna go live on cute micro farms upstate, or like the, the sizable majority of people in New York City would wanna do that. This massive urban area is important to the world and saving it in its current form is important. To do that, we would need an engineering project on a massive scale. And you know, as you look up and down the East Coast, this area is probably where the biggest sea well project would be the most likely to go. It's the place that can afford it. And it's a place that's going to need a seawall to protect the city, to protect that housing stock, to protect this important part of our country's intellectual and cultural and financial strength. A lot of these videos, I reach out to people like me who love quiet places and growing things. And I know that all of us, we have a big job to do in terms of getting our hands in the dirt. But the call to action here, it's different. This is a call for advocacy, for designing, for building for using the wealth and power of this area to push for lower emissions from every side, politics, technology, and implementation. It's our future, the future in our lifetimes that we are fighting for. The time to protect our best 2050 future is now. But let's wrap this up. Coastal New York is looking at significant warm-up. Summer's feeling about twice as long, milder winters, much less snow. There will be more extreme weather. The storms will get worse as time goes on. They should be really gnarly as we get into the 2030s. But what you really wanna look at is the sea. Sea level rise is a major direct and immediate threat to New York City. There are a lot of places underground today where they already need to run pumps to keep water out. And those pumps are abandoned. At some point they won't be enough, but there is a real solution, not a band-aid, that this area can reach towards its roots and find that solution. It's not gonna be easy work, but it could be done. There is a good future out there and we gotta work for it. This is Dr. Sherning with AR signing out. Please like and subscribe, help get the message out there. There is hope, we can prepare for what's coming. Let's get ready.